Hello, welcome to Movers, Shakers, Designers, and Makers. I'm Steve Carpenter, Dean of the College of Arts and Architecture here at Penn State. And I am so pleased to have with me today, Roberto Lugo, a uh, MFA graduate uh, from the year 2014. Uh, Roberto is a celebrated ceramic artist, social activist, a poet, an educator, who I have had the privilege of knowing uh, since the time he was a student here and continue to, to uh, uh, communicate with. Um, I, I'm just pleased to have him here with us today. Roberto, welcome. Thank you, thank you. And uh, just to start off, uh, big congratulations to you in your new role. Oh, thank you. This is a yeah. bit of a change from when, when you were a student, right? <laughs> it was, it was, yeah. Good yeah. times though. Good times, good times. Well, thanks, <laughs> I appreciate it, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I really um, am, am grateful for you to take some time out of your busy schedule and away from your family to, to sit down and chat. But I wondered if, uh, for the benefit of people um, watching this uh, this conversation uh, and who are not familiar with you, can you just give us a quick um, overview of your journey from not just, uh, we'll get to the Penn State journey in a second, but um, your journey from your neighborhood from where you grew up in, in Philly uh, to your undergraduate work and then through Penn State and uh, where you are now? Yeah, um, so I'm from Philadelphia, which is uh, where I currently live. I live right outside of Philadelphia in an area called uh, Glenside. And um, I live here for the first 22 years of my life. And um, I grew up in a really poor neighborhood in Philadelphia. And um, what I didn't know was the education system here at the time was really uh, terrible. Uh, and so uh, just to give you a sense of things, uh, in Philly, you have to apply to high schools. And I didn't, I didn't get into any of the high schools I applied to. So um, I kind of went to the local high school where you go if you don't get into any high school. And um, one of the first days of school we had, uh, I was in a, all the programs were like these, they were designed to be able to give you a job when you graduated. And mine's was hospitality and uh, so we were supposed to learn how to cook and do other things. And uh, the first day the teacher uh, handed us textbooks and she just said, well, we don't have any ingredients. So I just want you to write what's in this book. Uh, so it looks like you're working. Uh, so if anybody looks in the room, it looks like you're busy. And uh, you know, that was three hours of my day uh, for my freshman year. And, and I, I had to make the work and the effort to get myself out of that school. And um, you know, that set me up for a lot of things. Like um, I applied, I, I had an idea to maybe go to college uh, and I applied for the local community college, which is really like the only option. And uh, I never received a response back, but in hindsight, I think it was because back then you'd have to write an essay and it was all handwritten. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think they could understand my handwriting. I think that's, <laughs> that was the issue. And so, um, <laughs> You know, I, I didn't really know where I was going for a long time. And uh, about 22, uh, I noticed that everyone who I'd grown up with and was really close to, a lot of the, the men um, were incarcerated and a lot of my cousins were incarcerated. And um, I was working a lot of really hard jobs. Like I was a doorman, a security guard. I worked in a factory. And uh, I started thinking about how to make money quicker and you know the moment I had those thoughts and I thought about where everybody else ended up um, I moved away to Florida where a cousin of mine lived and um, community college classes there were really cheap and so I wanted to go for something that um, I I didn't I didn't think that uh, my writing or my, my, my lack of education at the time uh, would be apparent to everyone and so um, I grew up doing graffiti and, uh, you know, I had a, a passion for the murals of Philadelphia growing up and I decided to take an art class um, and I did and the teacher was a potter and he told me, uh, you know, you should try the pottery wheel and um, in that first class, I remember sitting down and uh, trying the wheel and making a bowl and 
there was a, a lot of feelings, but one of them was the absurdity of someone that came from where I come from having the luxury to take a pottery class mm -hmm. and how ridiculous that felt. And uh, also kind of felt like at any moment, someone might tap me on the shoulder and say, you're not supposed to be here. There's all these like inherent feelings that come from uh, leaving uh, where I grew up and being in a place where you're not worried for your life or you're not worried for food. And that's one of them. And, uh, you know, it was one of the first things in my life, if not the first thing that anyone ever told me that I was good at, you know, even though I was terrible, uh, my first pottery class, you know, everyone was really encouraging me. And so um, I heard of this great uh, institution for, for ceramics, um, the Kansas City Art Institute. And uh, I actually winded up getting into the School of the Arts Institute of Chicago for a semester. And I went there and uh, it was way too expensive. Uh, I couldn't afford to live there. So we winded up coming back. And then um, for a year, um, I just worked on my portfolio and it was, it was really difficult because I didn't have access to a wheel or a kiln. And so um, I actually removed the stove in my parents' house and I would um, lift up an entire kiln and move it into the kitchen and plug it in. Um, and that's how I made my portfolio to get into school. Wow. And, um, and then I got into the Kansas City Art Institute and um, I had a real passion for making functional pottery. And uh, I didn't really know where that lined up with, with my life story and what it was about. But um, one of the things that um, I winded up noticing was that whenever I would make work, that somehow my background and my race would come up um, even when I didn't want to. Uh, and there was a lot of ignorance, like people um, asking me for, uh, students asking me for my ID, security guards asking me, you know, what am I doing here? Uh, just things that like a normal student doesn't have to go through. And after a while, those things started to fold into my artwork. And I became more and more aware of um, how the world outside of where I grew up sees me. And um, it became really important for me to represent where I come from in my artwork and then also represent the people that got me here, um, mm -hmm. the people that have fought for civil rights, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the last, since the beginning of the world. But really, um, you know, a lot of my work uh, starts and stems from the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and, and beyond. And so um, one of the ideas that struck me when I was an undergrad was um, the, the European decorative ceramics that I had been studying um, that to me initially instinctively, uh, it felt like something that was too good for me or something that was expensive that I didn't want to touch. And I said, well, how powerful would it be if I made those things and how powerful would it be if I could make those things and then put images of the people um, that I feel like should be represented on those pots. Mm -hmm. And that's what I began doing. And that, that got me to, um, to apply to graduate school. And um, I grew up in Philadelphia. So you can imagine how often people would bring up Penn State in terms of obviously sports, but mm -hmm. um, it kind of seemed like a school that uh, not people like me go to. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it, it seemed far-fetched. It seemed like, you know, a, a dream. And um, when uh, I started to look into institutions and universities and I started to look at the faculty at Penn State, um, I just instantly knew this is the place I wanted to go. Hmm. So I remember hearing, getting the phone call um, from Penn State. It was a, I, 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 it was a, um, I was uh, making a glaze in the glaze room and I remember getting this call and hearing Shannon Goss voice and then dropping the mixer and like letting the glaze spill all over the floor and me just walking that? away and just being like, I'll deal with this later. Uh -huh. And uh, and I remember calling my wife right afterwards and saying like, we're going to Penn State. You know, like I don't even care what other schools tell me, I wanna go there. Wow. And uh, and it was the, when I when I first got to Penn State, the biggest difference was that I was surrounded by students and faculty that I felt like I could really trust that would tell me ways to improve my work, but not in a way to knock me down, in a way to help me to get what it is that I wanted 
Uh, and uh, that's exactly what I, what I found. And uh, I, I owe so much to it. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on the phone with you, um, because it's, it's one of the reasons why I teach and why I'm passionate about teaching, because I realized how much of a difference that makes in a person's life when it's the first time that they have someone that's been to the places where they're from and um, has seen those things and knows why you're passionate about making artwork and uh, is dedicated to helping you succeed in that. Mm -hmm. And so um, today, uh, what else should I say? Is that, is that a good, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a tenure track faculty at uh, yeah. Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. So I'm back home mm -hmm. and I get to teach. I, I teach in the streets. I pull up my pottery wheel and just teach people how to make on the wheel there. I teach in college. Um, and over the last uh, four years or so, in a two-year span, I gave 37 lectures around the country, uh, right? everywhere from, uh, you know, I spoke at Yale, Harvard, uh, Phillips Exeter, St. Paul's, um, even the Met. Uh, so I've been around, and now I, I get to just sort of not travel as much and be at home, <laughs> uh, which is great. That's nice. I mean, yeah. you're, you know, I've, uh, we've had several conversations over the years. I've heard different um, uh, moments of, of uh, what you just captured for us about your journey. Um, I've heard an expanded version of that. I've heard of an in-depth version of, of parts of it. Um, and one of the pieces that um, you didn't necessarily mention here, but you implied it, and I've heard you say this several times in different contexts. It's about when you put faces on your work or you put imagery on your work, you've said several times, you wanna put your face where it doesn't belong, right? Yeah. So this, this speaks to the, the, the idea that you were mentioning, putting people or I, uh, I, um, uh, images of folks from civil rights movement, important people within a space of social justice and social action, but putting your own face on artwork or putting your face where it doesn't belong. I love that that twist of, of phrase there. And so uh, it seems like that that's a theme, not just with your pots, right? I, I'm thinking about going to the community college. You mentioned uh, you felt at a certain level, right? This might be me projecting, but I'm trying to interpret here. You felt maybe you were in a place where you didn't belong. Then right. Art Institute of Chicago, that theme comes up again. Then even going to Kansas City Art Institute, there was that semblance of it. Penn State starts to be a place where um, you felt like you belonged at, at a certain level, right? Within terms of the conversations and the critique of your work. Um, but that's also the place where I would imagine you start to manifest that idea of putting your face where it doesn't belong on this pottery. And one place that I'm curious to know if you felt that you your face belonged or not was when you were in Rome. You are a recipient of the Rome Prize, man. This is incredible. Can you talk to me about what it, what it was like to, to be a recipient uh, uh, of the Rome Prize? And I know um, that that residency was complicated by COVID. Yeah. So can you can you talk about that that piece of your career? Yeah. It, um, I mean, as, as artists and I, I imagine scholars, uh, you know, uh, applying to uh, something like the American Academy of Rome to be a Rome Prize recipient, you don't go into it thinking you're going to get it. You know, you go into it thinking this will be a good experience. Uh, and uh, I got a call um, a few months after my application that they were interested in interviewing me. And for this interview, they fly you into New York and you meet these people in person. And um, I wasn't able to do that for one reason or another. So um, we decided we'd do a video interview. And then um, I had an emergency happen. And the only place that I was able to do my interview was at a Starbucks. And um, I sat <laughs> it down. A start, like a Starbucks in Philly? Where was the Starbucks? Starbucks in Philly. OK, all right. And I sat down and I opened my computer. And as it began talking, the, the gentleman, uh, I don't know if I should call him a gentleman, the, the, the person next to me got really angry that I was video chatting with someone at Starbucks and <laughs> made it known really loudly. And so I had to figure out how to switch positions in this really professional interview and still uh, continue to 
to have the conversation and um in in listening to feedback later on they said that was one of the reasons they were so impressed with me was that uh you know one of the things that was what ha was happening was there was actually another man there that was talking on the phone mm -hmm. uh and he uh on on video chat and he was a white man mm -hmm. and uh, I, I don't exactly know what the conversation was but he was much louder than i was uh -huh. but this guy next to me was not affected at all by him he was only upset about me talking and so uh just seeing how i, I dealt with that and then um, the question, the subsequent questions that I asked them about how uh, how I would be accommodated, uh, you know, was was uh, great. And you know, hearing hearing that I had gotten that, it made me feel um, validated for so many reasons. Um, as a ceramic artist, uh, you know, I didn't let them not having a ceramics facility get in my way of applying. You know, I said, what I have to do, what I have is really important. And this is a place that I feel like my work would prosper. Mm -hmm. And um, and just flying there, I got to take my mom, who's never been out of the country except for Puerto Rico, and flew her to Rome. And her and I got to walk the streets of Rome. And I got to take my children. And they learned some Italian. And we were having a great time for all of two weeks. And <laughs> two the studio weeks. is... Were you there that long? I didn't realize you were there even that long. Well, I was there for two weeks before it got shut down. And then I was there for another two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then we were told that the academy was closing. And uh, it was it was really heartbreaking and um, set, set me back quite a bit, uh, it just not just financially, but uh, emotionally, because we had sold our house right before we left. And so right. we we were also uh, theoretically homeless uh, because we, we rented Airbnbs for the last six months. And uh, I haven't really been able to, uh, when I first came back, I was really driven to keep making artwork. I had that hunger that I had before. And so I bought a kiln and a wheel and I, I made pottery in my parents' backyard. And, uh, you know, I was really proud of what I was doing. And then the moment I got to Philly, all of that that I had inside of me went away. And then I was, I was hit by the fact that like, I could be in Rome right now uh, making the artwork like in that short period of time, I made, you know, 20 teapots and, you know, 40 cups and I was getting ready to paint and mm -hmm. I had already done a painting and painted a pot and I was just moving, grooving. And, uh, you know, I realized that instead I'm in a, somebody else's house in Philadelphia that doesn't have air conditioning with my two kids. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it was a lot. And so um, I'm, I'm thankful the Academy has offered us to come back uh, in a few years. So we're, we're giving it a few years and we're going to go back in 2023 That's fantastic. to finish my time. Yeah. But the thing I miss most is the espresso, to be honest. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> so, um, so help me with the time frame though. Was that that was January? Uh, is that when that happened? When when were you? Yeah, in, uh, we Rome? we went there in January, and then um, so, sometime in February it closed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's also like a year of planning to get there, right? And so right. I mean, there's a time that you're there, but then also all the anticipation, and and we had to get visas, and mm -hmm. um, you know, but it's it's it. <laughs> It reminded me of it, being there with all those artists reminded me of why what we're doing is so important because, you know, one of the, I would say that the biggest asset of being at a residency like that um, is that you get to meet um, people uh, that are just incredible talents and thinkers. Um, and they also bring in people um, who are not uh, Rome Prize recipients, but people that, um, want to be there, uh, like uh, Fred Wilson. I just missed Fred Wilson. I just missed the Esther Gates and they were supposed to come back. And Sonia Clark was there and all these people that I really admire. And then um, there was several poets there that, uh, that really inspired me a lot and that we would, you know, it's like we, we were all, we were there for work, but we were also there for one another. And so there's a lot of moments that happen over shooting pool or waiting for dinner to happen. And we're just talking about our own work. And, uh, you know, I miss all those things. So that's one of the, that, that was really the part that was most heartbreaking was that I didn't 
I didn't get to um, un un unwrap those those relationships. Sure, no, I can imagine that's disappointing, but it's it's um, good to know that the uh, American Academy in Rome is extending the offer for you to return uh, after a while. So that's yeah. that that'll be fantastic. So picking up on that um, uh, point about missing out on those opportunities to connect with these the people who you named Sonia Clark, Fred Wilson, Theaster Gates. Um, I know, at least for me, con the connections between you and them with respect to the kind of work you do exist in this space of, of critical consciousness, uh, cultural critique, social and racial justice issues. Um, so I'm imagining you were also anticipating those kinds of conversations. Um, can you talk a, a little bit about um, your perspective on how art might serve as a catalyst for social change? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think some things that are set, are, are said in, in words can uh, immediately, be, immediately be really divisive. Like um, I, was th I was listening to a podcast yesterday, podcast yesterday on cancel culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that was really interesting about it was um, that the phrase politically correct is um, actually um, not popular in America. Like people don't like political correctness. People also don't like um, the term cancel culture. Like if you ask them outside of a like public, so we're all very conscious about what we're saying um, and we should be conscious of what we're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I notice is uh, I can say a lot of things with my artwork that communicate with people that otherwise would immediately shut down if I were to bring it up. So- um, Can you give me an example? Yeah, yeah. Um, like I, I have quite a few, I have quite a few people um, who, who engaged my artwork who are, um, who are conservative um, and uh, politically like right wing um, and also Christian uh, people. And my work challenges a lot of uh, the perspectives that those people hold as their most like uh, the central to their existence. And um, one of the things that happens is when I'm centering a conversation around something like Black Lives Matter, um, you know, the question is, is whether or not you think Black Lives Matter. Let, mm -hmm. let's, let's have that conversation. And, uh, you know, do you think this, this space doesn't belong on this pot? And, um, and one of the things that's interesting is like, if I have had uh, those, some of those same conversations with those same people with just words or just posts, and mm -hmm. it goes really wrong uh, in terms of us not getting anywhere and us, them, like I, I'm aware of like being able to have um, a, an exchange uh, within like a more of like a liminal space, right? Like this kind of back and forth and like getting something from one another. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I think for the most part in, in contemporary life when we're um, engaging with someone who's in opposition of us, the whole purpose of it is to get them to change their mind. Um, whereas I think artwork, what it's doing is challenging um, what, you, what you believe um, and m giving you new questions. So um, it's not, you know, my wife always tells me like, I don't need you to resolve things for me. Um, you know, I just need you to listen to me. Mm -hmm. And I think artwork provides ears. Uh, it provides mouth too, but it also like encourages people to listen. Um, and so a lot of times with my artwork, people don't really know what they're looking at until they sit with it for a while, um, which is, uh, you know, like the idea that putting a black face on a pot is political, uh, you know, makes you think like, why is that political? You know, like why, why is the phrase black lives matter political? You right. know, like, why is that not just like a, a, a common agreed upon, um, you know, way of, of thinking and, uh, you know, what, uh, an example of that is, you know, someone who follows my artwork, um, who's a really supporter and an advocate. Uh, recently, we ran into a situation where my wife, um, she, uh, she was helping with a, a mother's group who, um, who's part of an international organization who came out and specifically uh, did not want to make a statement on Black Lives Matter or any statement on racial equality, mm -hmm. and my wife and her my wife and her group decided they would 
um, disband and create their own organization um, and support and be a more open, equitable space. And, uh, you know, this person, uh, the same person is, you know, in disagreement of this move. And, uh, and it's interesting how I'm, I'm having conversations with this person through my artwork. Uh, but when it comes to these, these phrases or terms uh, that we're using online to communicate and engage with one another, um, you know, they, they immediately distance themselves from it. And so I find that often uh, my artwork can be that space um, to, to create a bridge. Um, and I see it often, like a lot of, right now my work is carried in a lot of museums and um, some of the things that, uh, that they share with me um, and that I see in person is that there are people who uh, normally would have no interest in the decorative um, arts wing of their museum who are engaging with it uh, for, diff for different reasons because they heard there's a pot um, at the High Museum that has Andre 3000 on it and they're curious as to like what that's about, you know? And then they see my hip hop bowl and they understand the history behind the jazz bowl and how at the time jazz is very similar to like how hip hop is viewed today, it's sort of, controversial and, and contemporary for their time. And, um, and so it, it allows me to say things that, um, that I have a hard time saying with words. It doesn't necessarily mean that's the reason why everybody does it, mm -hmm. um, but it's really helped me to be able to communicate in ways that I, I can't otherwise. And I would imagine that the conversations that you have with people about specific pots, I mean, that's one type of conversation, but when you're not present, other conversations would most likely um, uh, uh, emerge from people viewing your work and, and, and talking about it. Uh, I have one great example of that, just yeah, quickly. At the, sure. at the New Fields Museum in Indianapolis, there was actually just an article written um, about the curator there, and forgive me because her, her name um, doesn't come to mind, uh, but uh, she recently resigned from her position at the New Fields, and she was uh, um, curator uh, and she was brought in to um, help their organization be able to um, to commit to more work from underrepresented artists. And so she uh, purchased uh, for the museum a pot of mine that had Colin Kaepernick on one side and um, John Brown on another side. And they brought it to the board and there was this like really uh, controversial conversation that happened, a lot of conflict in there. And um, eventually she resigned her position in part because of this conversation um, and in the realization that um, she felt tokenized, like she was just there to like say that we had this, but not actually do the work. And, uh, you know, now I'm, I, I shared her story the other day and it just reminded me of like all these conversations that are happening about my work you know you can put another artist in the same space but um without me there and the the thing that i want to happen is what's happening right like these two people are having a conversation at the end of the day colin kaepernick was a really controversial person at the time but now not so much i mean now everyone's kneeling so many people are in support of that and that was the whole point of the pop was in john brown's day you know, he was seen as a controversial figure because he was anti-slavery and he was a white person and he was hung, uh, uh, he was hung for, for this. And, you know, my point was that um, I'm hoping that something like taking a knee in support of, um, of anti-discrimination um, for uh, black citizens um, in regards to police, I don't think that should be a controversial thing at all. Um, and, uh, and so it's just so interesting how it winded up playing out, uh, without me seeing it. And then I heard of it, um, later on. Uh, no, that's a great example. Um, I wasn't thinking of that, uh, specifically when I made the comment, but I recall reading an article, uh, yeah. perhaps the same article uh, that you're referencing that talks about that, um, outline that same, uh, that same situation. Um, and, you know, I, and then I can't help but make the connection to the fact that the Palmer Museum of Art here on our campus has a work by Roberto Lugo, and um, which was um, uh, selected by uh, the, the Friends of the Palmer and, and being able to make that decision collectively. And um, essentially there were three works 
that they were considering purchasing from you. And they, they talked about all three of them and, and had a chance to vote. And so the fact that I've seen firsthand people talk about um, the, not only the images on your work, but then the issues um, and the, the social and the cultural conversations that emerge from the imagery on your work. I've seen that in real time. Um, and then the, ge the gesture is not that we don't want his work, but that the exact opposite is the case. We do want his work because we want those conversations to happen. And now, you know, your work is is in the in the art museum, uh, a space that you visited as a student. Uh, yeah. Tell, tell me what that must. How, what does that feel like? That was that's one of the most special moments uh, for me. Uh, one of the reasons why is because um, one of the pieces that inspired uh, my work was. Uh, a photograph there by Yinka Shunabari and uh, hearing the story um, and sort of this fusion of cultures and being, um, you know, being in in, uh, in England and then also having this like African background and then, you know, sort of dissecting that history and, and making an artwork uh, from it and but also like the thing that drew me about the, the photograph itself was just the, the aesthetics of it. Like it was, it was beautiful, you know, and um, haunting at the same time. And it felt like it had a story that, um, that you didn't quite get yet. And then, you know, you read about Yinka uh, and, um, and then you just like, you get it, you know? And, and that for me was, was the goal that I have in my artwork um, was to sort of like have these connections um, from the places that uh, the different communities that I found myself in um, and you know in, in many ways the pot winds up being um, a self-portrait even when I'm not putting a, a portrait on there because it's it's all these sort of um, patterns and references that I'm passionate about and uh, people who have inspired me to be where I am and it's almost like this full circle where I get to um, pay homage to them in this way and to see it there and to think that uh, maybe another student might be or, or not even a student just anyone might be so inspired by it mm -hmm. um, and it might in, uh, impact their life it just felt like a really full circle moment you know for me um, that was a really, there's a couple of moments in my life that I felt have been really, um, that have made me feel like, uh, like what I'm doing is, is, is right. And that I'm fully supported. And um, for me, uh, this moment at the Palmer's Museum, and then also um, last year, um, I had to work purchased by the um, African American Heritage Museum, um, the Smithsonian in DC. And uh, that was when, when, I, when I heard that, uh, a lot of my fears went away, you know, cause it was like, it was like me being accepted. Uh, and me, uh, I had searched my whole life for being accepted in a community cause I've always felt like racially ambiguous, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and that, that just meant so much to me. And, um, and then also to feel like, uh, the place where I felt physically accepted into a space, um, that I, that a part of me is still there and a part of me exists. And, um, I'm part of the, I'm part of the, the history uh, of that place. Uh, it's a really special moment because, if you're someone who's who's grown up and told that you are 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 not um, important, uh, and I mean I've literally been told that, but also just societally by um, the ways that people raise you and talk to you, uh, you know, to be validated in that way is is really um, remarkable. And and honestly, it's, those are the things that I'm I know I'm going to remember at the end of my life. Like I think those two moments are things that I just yeah. Uh, that's powerful. Uh, and in some ways, you know, I'm thinking about um, uh, your work being uh, uh, accepted in the uh, 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 National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, it's almost as a realization of a thread of your work, right? And so maybe it's 
not that you check off a box, oh, I've done that, but it affords you now a different perspective on what it means to be accepted and to be part of a conversation, as well as to recall um, what it means to be uh, excluded and marginalized. Not that that piece has gone away by any stretch of the imagination, but it does suggest this interesting narrative that you can have a simultaneity, you can have a realization, but yet the work must still continue. And um, I would imagine some some ways that um, uh, there's there's some uh, renewed energy for you that emerges from that. So um, you're always working on something. I mean, you're not you don't just make pots. Uh, sometimes you say, "Oh, I'm going to do a series of bowls," or you have um, I mean, you, you you draw, you do paintings. Um, you're a spoken word artist. Uh, 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 you you also do performance work, uh, public work. Um, I know you've been doing some films. What what are you working on now that excites you? Man, um, maybe the question is wrong. Maybe the question is, what are you working on that doesn't excite you? And that would be nothing. I mean, all everything you do excites you. But what what are you working on now that that really excites you the most? Yeah. Um, well, I I've actually uh, been. I worked on a short film uh, called Without Wax with a couple of uh, peers that I met in New Haven when I was working on a project there. I'm teaching kids how to make memorials, uh, ceramic memorials. And um, and it was a story of, of, uh, of my brother and I, actually when I was in Penn State, uh, and it's about my brother being incarcerated while I was in graduate school and the, the pain of uh, knowing that I was doing, fulfilling my dream and, you know, he was uh, locked up. And um, it was just one small segment of my life, but um, we, we did a lot of work through that. And one of the things we did was we went back to this, um, it was a store um, that um, we used to live in the back of. We, we lived in the back of a store for a long time. And uh, in the filming of it, I got to be in a place that I was when I was nine years old and see some of the wallpaper and the flooring. And it just like really, it, it was probably one of the most um, humbling and magical experiences ever was to really feel like I'm doing something to represent my family. And uh, it was a very proud moment. And it encouraged me to keep writing about um, a lot of the experiences that I've had. And one of the things that's been really great is like I'm writing without um, without um, worrying about what somebody who reads it is gonna think because the, the whole point of it is like, I don't even need for anybody else to read this. Like I'm just writing uh, this story, my story. And I don't know what it's gonna turn into, but we're thinking about a full length film and, uh, you know, that's something that uh, I'm really excited about because one of, the, um, one of the challenges that I've accepted and fought um, with ceramics is it's also difficult to communicate with um, um, as broad of an audience as what I, I hope to. Because one of the things that I realized when I was traveling and talking to students is that, like, for me, my story is that I wind up becoming a potter. But you could really fill in the blank for whatever it is that your dream is or whatever it is that you uh, find yourself passionate about. Like whatever it is, you can be successful at it. And so that's sort of been the point about it um, and really emphasizing um, that your, your obstacles can, um, can then be used as, as an asset um, and your, your tool to uh, have the means to, to have something to talk about and have something to say. Um, and so, you know, what's interesting is when I make video, um, I'm able to connect with a lot of people that I otherwise wouldn't. And, uh, and even though there's clay being used and clay in a lot of the conversation, it almost like plays um, a backseat to the content of it, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, really one of the things that's, uh, that's thrilling for me is the opportunity to like uh, do what it is that I do, but to be able to talk to people regardless if they have connection with it. You know, because one of the things that I found um, is uh, I might get a lot more, like for example, online, um, 
online stuff can be really deceiving. Like for example, how many followers you have on social media. Like I know people who make millions of dollars off of their artwork and they just have a couple of hundred people following them on social media and uh, people who like don't even really sell what they make and they're just a hobbyist who have hundreds of thousands of right. followers on social media. So it's really confusing for people. Um, but one of the things that I notice is like when I put a cup up, um, you know, I'll get a lot more likes than when I put up um, something that I worked on a year for like, a, you know, a big piece or a series. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, I think, is because a lot of times people can see themselves with that thing. Like it reminds them of like right. holding it and it existing and it's, 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 um, and it's about them. Like it's part of them, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's what happens a lot with video work too, is that it's like really easily accessible and really easy to like get that, that message out. Mm -hmm. And so once one of the most successful videos I've had in terms of social media was just a video of me teaching people how to throw outside and uh, I just posted it on a whim and then I looked at it and it had like a thousand shares and all these people were viewing it. And I just thought it was so funny because these are people that I never talk with because they're not involved in the ceramics community, mm -hmm. but they just thought the idea of somebody throwing pottery outside and seeing me teach a, a black man how to teach pottery um, out in the street and me seeing me teach a sex worker how to make pottery out in the street, mm -hmm. you know, and they're not being an obstacle or barrier for them to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think really connected with people um, because they, they sort of fill in, you know, what if there wasn't an obstacle to do this? What if there wasn't an obstacle to do that? And sure. um, that's the sort of conversation that I really want to engage in. Nice, nice. No, um, you know, uh, you're not just about making objects. You make, you're about making experiences, making conversation, making a difference, making people think. Um, and um, you know, one of my catchphrases is uh, question me answers. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, that's what you do. Um, embedded in your response though, um, what was um, essentially some advice to, to, to students, to, uh, to undergrad students or, or um, to uh, you know, folks who um, might be entering the arts or entering ceramics for the first time. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, it came across as advice. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, the fact that you just had a birthday recently, a, a milestone birthday of sorts. Um, mm -hmm. And so you might, you know, for me, I have these milestone birthdays. I've had a few more than you have. Um, and you reflect back on, well, when I was younger or wow, a lot of time has passed. So. Um, what advice would you give to uh, 18 year old Roberto Lugo? Man, uh, that, that is something that really I've, I've just learned recently, which is uh, to, to not focus on the people, uh, to not focus on all the people who doubt you um, and to, to um, put your, to be able to, um, put a lot of energy into the people that um, really care for you, you know, and that doesn't mean that you're not around people that uh, give you critique or, or offer you advice on uh, or, you know, whatever. But um, I've just found that I've spent so much of my life worrying about people that are not anymore in my life and people that, um, that, uh, that sought to uh, hurt me one way or another. And we all have those people um, that we meet and we focus so much energy and time talking about them, worrying about them, doing all these things. And all that time, I could have been like helping somebody else mm -hmm. who really needs it to get to where they wanted to be. Um, right. and, uh, and also mm -hmm. to be around people that encourage me and that um, you know uh, have my best interests at heart. And so, um, one of the things that I found is like, uh, is like real trust comes in being around people um, that um, are, that have the courage to be able to tell you what they see. Uh, and, and at the same time, that way, when you know you're, they, they're giving you a compliment or giving you support, you know that that's coming from a really honest place. And mm -hmm. you know that like, when certain people tell me, Rob, this, this piece that you made is where it's at. Like, I, I really feel like this is what you wanted. Uh, 
I I know that to be true. Like that that person is the same person that told me what I made last week was really not what I intended mm -hmm. and uh, corrected me and helped me. So um, I like to surround myself with people like that. And the more that I'm doing that, the more that I'm finding my mental health is in a good place because, um, you know, even when uh, all, all, all professions are, are competitive, but one of the things that's really challenging about the arts is it often is, it comes from a very personal place. So we're making work, even if it's like about process or not in, not directly like a narrative or, or a biography, it's personal. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you, when you are surrounding yourself by people who don't have your best interests in mind, um, then you, you constantly feel personally attacked. Um, and so it doesn't mean that you're not, that you, you're not going to have people around you who, um, who make your life difficult, but, um, I, I just learned to like start thinking to myself that, um, I'm valuable and that what I have to say is important mm -hmm. and that, um, if these people don't see that, then they're really just, they're not worth all the time that I've been spending on them. And then that's so important in the art, uh, in the arts, because um, the difference between um, my undergraduate experience and, and being surrounded by people um, that told me that um, there's no way I'm going to get into graduate school and that, uh, you know, my work is really behind and my writing is really behind to being with people that like, see uh at penn state see who who i am and want the best for me and um are honest with me but at the same time i know that that's just like them telling me like hey your fly's open you know and you gotta go back and fix that situation yeah. and that's only because i don't want you to be embarrassed or that's only because i know that this is not what you're trying to say right. and this is how it's being communicated and um i uh, the fellow grads that I had at Penn State, we talk uh, just about once a week um, and we text daily and uh, we do residencies together. Like this, this last summer, we were supposed to be doing a residency, the five of us. We taught, we teach together and we're in complete support of one another in, in all aspects of life. And those are the same people that are like, um, you know, Rob, that sculpture you made the feet, uh, you need to work on that, you know, or like Rob, uh, I don't know if this teapot's going to pour the way that you made it. And that's the same person that's like, dude, that thing you made is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm really proud of you. The first person to say, you tell you congratulations. Mm -hmm. Like you need more of those people in your life. I agree. I hear you. I, I would imagine 18 year old, 18 year old Roberto Lugo would have listened to that advice. Is that fair? Would he have listened to I that think advice? he would have. I yeah. think he would have, yeah. Good. Well, I don't bad. know if he would have actually like <laughs> executed it, but he would have definitely <laughs> have listened to it. Well, he was he was a polite, uh, a polite person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, listen, Roberto, um, it's been a thrill chatting with you. Before we wrap this thing up, I have to ask you these these questions about Penn okay. State. Right. Okay. And so it's about your time at Penn State when you were a student. And so I will ask you a, a, a question. And you just give me the answer. It's like this quick back and forth. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. What is your favorite flavor of Penn State Creamery ice cream? Oh, uh, I think that was the, uh, there was a peach one. The peachy, peachy paterno? paterno? Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah, that was it. Where, where did you live when you were at Penn State? I lived in uh, Belfont. In Belfont, okay. Who was one person of influence for you during your Penn State experience? Shannon Goff. Shannon Goff. What moment or experience stands out to you from your time here at Penn State? Sitting one-on-one -on -one with Stephen Carpenter in the gallery in my graduation show. Oh my. I remember that moment as clearly as I'm looking at you on this computer screen. <laughs> yeah, me too. Last question. What was your favorite spot on campus? Oh, my favorite. Are you still there? I'm still okay. here. Yeah. Um, what, what was your favorite spot on campus? Oh, man. Um, there's there's a, a, a classroom right next to the um, 
the gallery. Yes. There's just a, like one classroom where we go and they have like a projector there. And it's just a long table with a bunch of chairs. Uh, and we would have so many conversations in that. And I just remember like every time I walked into that room, uh, I felt like this really warm, fuzzy feeling. Uh, and it just, just that room, anytime I, I, I went into that room, it just felt like something great's about to happen. Outstanding. I, I know yeah. so many great things happened in that room. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was a classroom. It was a hangout room. It's a, it, it does so many things. Um, yeah. Roberto, I, I'm going to struggle here to tell you how much this conversation has meant to me and how much you mean to me um, as a, a, a former student and as a fellow artist and as a friend. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. And listen, the next time you're in State College, let's get together. Uh, let's have another one of those conversations. What do you say? And some peachy paterno. Yeah, some peachy paterno. All right, on me, okay? <laughs> All right, man. Okay, good talking to you. Thanks, Roberto. Right. Bye, everybody.